Welcome, folks. For those of you that are familiar, I am at the lovely historic Point Hudson here. You see all of our buildings. In fact, that's the Fish and Wildlife Office in Port Townsend. And I'll just do a quick 360 to show everybody where I'm at. Beautiful day, beautiful location. And so with that, before I really go down to the water and start exploring the various uh, submerged aquatic vegetation and uh, other uh, wildlife down there, why don't we go through my presentation real quick and give a little history on Point Hudson. So again, I'm Nam Su. I'm the Area Habitat Biologist for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I cover uh, North Kitsap County all the way to uh, East Jefferson County up to Port Townsend here. Uh, as Monica mentioned, I also am a member of the Jefferson Marine Resources Committee committee and uh, and if you are a previous beach naturalist you re recognize me from some uh, trainings and workshops um, so let's go ahead and proceed to the next slide one of the reasons why I chose Point Hudson and you'll see down here on the map Point Hudson highlighted uh, is because of the fact that this is a very unique marine ecosystem for me uh, oh, Point Hudson is at the confluence of both the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Puget Sound. It's at the western entrance of Admiralty Inlet. So being as such, it gets the influence both from the water body in the Strait as well as the water body in the main Puget Sound Hood Canal. And so there's, there's a lot of life that's happening at this point. Um, and this point, uh, Point Hudson, it's been used by the native people here for thousands of years before uh, Westerners came and settled here, uh, primarily used by the Sklom and Chimicum people uh, as a ceremonial site, but as well as a resource har uh, harvest location. Uh, this is a very rich area, as I've mentioned. Uh, a lot of shellfish used to be harvested here and a lot of waterfowl. Next, please. And if, unfortunately, as I said that, there, you know, earlier there were three or four great blue herrings sitting here in front of me feeding, but they, they all seem to have moved off now. Uh, this is just a, a picture, an oil painting back in the early 1900s of what Point Hudson used to look like as opposed to now. Next slide. It used to be a tidal lagoon, uh, salt marsh area uh, until uh, right around World War II, just before World War II when it was when all these buildings, historical buildings were built and it was used as a uh, quarantine area for people coming into the ports in Washington. Uh, next please. So now we have a more recent uh, contemporary aerial photo of what Point Hudson looks like. It's been heavily modified by human use and turned into a commercial uh, marina as well as a uh, site. Still a very popular site for recreation and whatnot. And one thing to point out is that we have this really interesting sand spit to the east on Point Hudson here. And that's where I'm going to be today. I'm going to be in the back lagoon as well as the sand spit and the floor, uh, the eastern part of that facing uh, Whidbey Island. Next, please. Uh, just some historical tea sheets I like to share of what Point Hudson used to look like before it was developed. Again, there was that one oil painting I shared uh, just a few slides ago. But you'll see that before it was dredged out into this marina basin, it used to be this lagoon uh, that we see a lot of uh, along the coastlines of Washington uh, previ uh, previous to, to development and impacts. And so you have before and after on these tea sheets uh, before it was developed. Next. So real quickly, I want to touch on the coastal geology here, what caused, what caused this very interesting point to develop and form. Uh, this is, uh, along our coasts here, we have what's known as the Toro Drift. That's basically the transport of sediment up and down our beaches. For anybody that lives on the water or frequents our beaches, they will, re they will uh, recall that during winter storms and whatnot, a lot of sediment move up and down our beaches from that wave energy. And so Point Hudson is is in the middle of a drift sail. If you see this uh, figure from Department of Ecology's Coastal Atlas, we have a drift that goes from, uh, it's kind of hard to see on my screen, but basically you have a right to left drift when looking at the ocean. You have this drift coming from the front uh, of uh, the waterfront of Port Townsend coming east and wrapping north around this point. At the same time, you also have net drift uh, coming from the northern parts on, of these bluffs here. Um, and I don't know if we can switch to my screen real quick uh, so I can show the bluffs. 
Yeah, so those are the bluffs between Point Hudson and Point Wilson, which is out there at Fort Warden. And those are fantastic feeder bluffs. Uh, and they contribute, they're, they're the source of a lot of clean, good sediment for our beaches. And um, so a lot of the drift brings both uh, sediment from the north as well as the south into this sand spit, which is an accretion point. So if we go back to my presentation and go to the next slide. It should be a figure from the Department of Ecology showing the various, uh, the various landforms. There you go. So you see in yellow, we have accretion points. These are areas that sediment accrete. We have areas where it erodes from those feeder bluffs, those blue areas to the north of me that I pointed out. And of course, again, this, this accretion shore form is a sand spit uh, because of the prevailing winds from the south. Uh, next, please. So with all that history and geology in mind and said, we're here to talk about the biology and ecology of this very unique location. Uh, one of the last figures I want to show at this point, share at this point, is this map from the Department of Ecology that shows uh, documented or observed submerged aquatic vegetation that has been mapped. Uh, this is an area that because of how complex and how much water flow there is, uh, it has both a lot of seagrass in terms of eelgrass, but there also is surf grass here. We'll talk about the difference between those two species of seagrass. But there are also a lot of kelp and other seaweed and macroalgae. Uh, that's, that's the main reason why I chose this site because there, there's a lot to talk about and I can certainly use more than the hour we have to, to go over everything here. It's a very unique location. I'm gonna try to walk really slowly down the beach from, uh, from, the, from the top of the beach where those buildings are down towards this lagoon area. Basically, yeah, uh, that picture shows just how diverse in submerged aquatic vegetation uh, this location is. We have seagrass right next to kelp, right next to a bunch of seaweed. Uh, one of my favorite sites to come and visit. Thanks for that, Bob. Let's go back to my camera. <laughs> Okay, so let me switch the camera and look out over the lagoon. Okay, you should be seeing the lagoon um, that I'm standing in right here. And out there is the sand spit, which we're going to traverse over in a minute or a few more minutes, and we will also explore the outside. But what I want to do while I'm in here is talk a little bit about this really unique habitat formed by this lagoon. Uh, there's a lot less wave energy here at certain tidal elevations. So that's allowed a lot of eelgrass to grow in this lagoon. And before I step into the water there, I want to point out just over there, I don't know if you can see, I'm pointing at a great blue heron that's foraging in this lagoon. There's a lot, of, there are a lot of fish that hang out here and it essentially is a tide pool right now uh, with a little drainage out into the ocean at this low of a tide. Um, for those of you that uh, are real big birders, I'll also point out there were a few ducks here feeding off of all this seaweed you see. Um, and at certain times of the year, the migratory brants, they look like Canada geese, but they're a little smaller. They, this lagoon is filled with brants feeding off of the eelgrass in here. So lots of bird and waterfowl, like I mentioned, historically, uh, the Sklom and uh, Chimicum people used to come here and hunt all those waterfowl that would uh, congregate here. So, hey, Nam, Nam, are the brands gone now? I saw them last month. Yeah, I don't see any of them right now. I think they're they are already gone. I'm used to seeing them uh, late late winter, early spring. Hey. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for thanks for asking. So without further ado, I'm going to slowly walk into this lagoon here. Uh, you'll see that there is a lot of uh, seaweed and kelp that's washed into this lagoon. You'll see that there's just layers and layers of what we call rack. Uh, that's the rack line of all this uh, biomass and, and decaying debris that washes in here. But there's a lot of really cool seaweed that's growing in here too. This is a specimen that's not washed up. It's actually grown in here. Um, 
And what's really unique about this particular specimen, actually, is that this bulbous uh, growth on it is a different kind of seaweed that is parasitic that grows on top of this small lacy uh, seaweed. Um, I don't have my guide on me, so I'm not going to try to attempt to ID this one. But as we go further out, I will be able to ID some of the more common species here. So slowly heading into this lagoon. I think today's tide, by the way, is a minus two. I think it's a minus two or so, um, relative to mean low or low water. And it's, it's really exposed a lot of this beach. Uh, mind you that in this tide pool and lagoon, I'm still up to my um, ankles in water. So as I go further into this lagoon, we start seeing these eelgrass beds. Hope everybody can see the eelgrass on top of the water. Really beautiful eelgrass bed. That's what the brands come in here to feed on. Um, and it's a really important, uh, really important submerged aquatic, uh, aquatic vegetation species. Um, and without really reviewing a lot of the answers, I think this is a good time for a poll question. All right, I'll put it up. Thank you. All right, so the poll says, why are submerged aquatic vegetation, SAP, important? Answers are starting to roll in. Very good. And while as, as we do that poll, one thing I will mention is that eelgrass is protected on the state level. It's protected by state law as a species of special concern. And I'll wait another second for uh, answers to roll in before I, I share why that is. All right, I think we're good. We got 34 of 43 people and everyone's answering the same so far, which is all of the above. All right, very good. Uh, exactly, yeah, eelgrass in particular is, uh, it, but I know that question was about all submerged aquatic vegetation, but eelgrass in particular are great uh, habitat for various species. And for a lot of our commercially important species, eelgrass is a nursery habitat. So the juvenile stages of a lot of these organisms live in eelgrass, such as Dungeness crab, uh, juvenile out-migrating salmon will spend a significant amount of time foraging and rearing in these eelgrass grass beds. Um, not only that, eelgrass itself provides some nutrients. There's not too many species that directly feed on eelgrass. But if you look at this eelgrass here, you'll see there's a lot of growth on top of it. You see me rubbing this off. That's all algae. That's epiphytic algae. That's fouling or growing on the surface of the eelgrass. That's a lot. Of, uh, there are a lot of organisms that feed on that uh, epiphytic diatom layer or the algae that's grown on eelgrass. Um, so not only does it provide uh, habitat and complexity in the water for species to live in, it also provides a source of nutrients and, and food for various organisms. Uh, it's very important in the nutrient and, and uh, gas cycle of oxygen, carbon, and whatnot. And, and you know, for us, uh, especially during these t contemporary times of climate change and, and whatnot, there is a lot of research going into blue carbon or how, how plants like eelgrass, salt marsh uh, communities, and even kelp beds, how those, those plants can help sequester carbon dioxide and reduce ocean acidification. So yes, to all of the above, um, that's why submerged aquatic vegetation and in particular eelgrass is important. Very good. So with that said, I'm gonna slowly check out this one kelp species in here, just because I see a really good specimen. Um, you know, for the most part, my presentation, you know, my intent is to just walk around out here and point out really cool species as they come up for me. So this is a kelp species of kelp. It's actually attached to the bottom. I'm just giving a light tug to make sure it is attached. Um, and let's see, Bob, do you know if we have uh, a slide for this species, the winged kelp, Alaria margonata? We do. Let let's go ahead and show up. that slide. Yep, there you go. That, that's what we're looking at in my screen. And while we have this uh, screen up, what I will point out, uh, while we have the slide up, 
I'll point out the fact that this is called wing kelp because if you look at the picture on the left hand side, uh, aside from the main blade, you'll see two little blades on the bottom, uh, uh, just above the hold fast. Uh, and that's what the wings, quote unquote, are that gives uh, this kelp species its name. And uh, one interesting fact is that the, these two wings are basically where the spores are generated. So when these are uh, reproducing, you'll see spores, uh, spore patches uh, on these wings. And on bigger specimen, you can have more than two wings. So if we go back to my camera, let's, let's look at this specimen I have here, which is pretty big. So yeah, Alaria marginata, I recognize it by this mid, mid rib stipe, uh, right down the middle of the blade. But also, again, these uh, wings, these blades on the bottom that all called, that gives it its name as a wing kelp. And I'm trying to look for one of these wings that have spores on there. But I don't think this one is quite there yet. So a very beautiful specimen, again, there are very few places around the Puget Sound that I see eelgrass or seagrasses right next to kelp. So one of the reasons why I wanted to come up. So as I turn around and look over, I see another very common kelp species. In fact, if you ask me what the state kelp of Washington should be, I would, I would, I would make it this one. Uh, this is bull kelp, no bull whip kelp. I think most people who have been on a beach in Washington would recognize uh, this particular kelp. This one is called uh, Neriocystis leukiana. And Bob, if you could go to that slide, I can talk, we can show folks uh, the Latin name of the species. And then we can go back to, to this uh, here in a second. I'll point out some cool features. Great, thank you. So again, what I have in front of me is this bull kelp. Uh, it, it, it's the dom it's the dominant canopy forming kelp in Washington. Uh, it forms canopies because of this pneumaticus or air bladder that you see that makes the bulb on the bow kelp. That helps it compete against other submerged aquatic vegetation by lifting its uh, blades above everything else. So uh, ecologically, it's able to to start out uh, growing in deeper areas. But over time, it's able to get up and above all the other algae around it because of that pneumaticus. So that's a very special feature. And because of the canopy forming nature of bull kelp, it's also a very important species in terms of habitat. Uh, anybody that is a experienced fisherman in the Sound, in the Salish Sea, knows that there are always fish around bull kelp beds. And it's because of that three-dimensional nature that's caused by their, their canopy forming uh, uh, morphology or oh, the fact that they're, they're able to create so much complexity uh, for, in terms of nooks and crannies and habitat for, for organisms to live in. I am gonna go back to the, I'm gonna go back to the bow kelp, but since we're screen sharing now, let's go ahead and switch to the sugar rack. Uh, I think it's the previous slide, because I see some of those, thank you. Yeah, so sugar rack or Saccharina natissima is another kelp species of, another very common kelp species found throughout uh, the Salish Sea. Uh, I'm bringing this up because uh, I see quite a few specimens of this next to me. We're gonna look at it here in a second. But the reason why I like to share this slide uh, of the sugar rack is because it uh, sugar rack especially exhibits a very unique growth habit or what we call uh, um, phenotype or, or morphology. A phenotype is just basically uh, a different growth habit or characteristic that, uh, that one species can grow into various different, uh, uh, have, have different growth habits just like plants. You can train them to grow uh, into really bushy plants or really tall plants, depending on the conditions, environmental conditions. So similarly for sugar rack or saccharina latissima, depending on the currents, they develop these different uh, patterns on the blades, these different sculpting patterns. And Bob, if you would switch to sli uh, switch the slide to the um, the one with the scientific literature. Yes, that's it. Uh, the reason why I bring this interesting fact up is uh, this ability to change the pattern on their blades is one of the reasons that give kelp the entire order or um, family of kelp the name laminarians. 
Um, so if you look at their Latin name taxonomically, all kelp fall under the order laminary, uh, laminary aliens. Or la they're all laminarians. Um, and this is because they have these patterns that break up the laminar flow or the boundary layer of water that flows over the top of their blade. Um, hopefully I'm not, I'm not talking too thick in science here and losing anybody's attention. Basically, uh, for as an example, if you were a kelp, if you were a sugar rack in a location with a very high currents, you probably want to be relatively smooth as far as the pattern on your blades because you don't want to induce too much drag uh, in an area of too much currents that would put you at risk of being uprooted or torn out. However, if you were a sugar rack in an area with low currents and there is not as much gas exchange or new shooting exchange between the surface of your blades and the water column, then you would want to grow these sculpting patterns because if you look at these figures on the bottom right of your screen, you'll see that those those patterns on the blade essentially creates all these back eddies that break up the boundary layer or the laminar layer of flow on the surface. That causes more mixing and maximizes gas and nutrient exchange. Um, so very interesting. This is what we call, you know, phenotypic plasticity, the ability for one species of organism to exhibit different phenotypes in response to environmental cues. In this case, it's in response to currents. Um, so I'm going to let that soak in for a second uh, while I have Bob switch the slide back, uh, switch it back to me. And uh, if anybody has any questions about that, that um, I'll open that up. But I, when I learned that in school, I always thought that was really cool. Um, you know, all the kelp were called laminarians because they have the ability to break up laminar flow uh, with their morphology. And so here's the bow kelp again. One thing I want to point out in the bow kelp, and the reason why I really like looking at these specimens, is here's a perfect example. I do a fair amount of algae pressing myself, and when I press these algae uh, into a, a fixed specimen, it just is, is a great way to capture the growth history, the life history, or the life stage of the specimen. Uh, one of the favorite things I like to point out on the bow kelp is the fact that uh, these blades split off from one another along this middle suture line. I'm hoping you can all see this. You will see this blade has not fully split. So this is one, one blade that is ultimately going to split down the middle and turn into two blades along that suture line. Very interesting. Uh, this particular sp uh, specimen of Nereocystis or bulk kelp has not gotten to the point where it's spawning yet because it produces spores on the end of these blades as they degrade, uh, spores come off and spread through the water column. So that's the bow kelp, Nereocystis leukiana. We're gonna come over here and just behind me, we have a bunch of this uh, sugar rack, Saccharina latissima. Really, again, really beautiful specimen. And here you can see some of those patterns, sculpting patterns on the blade that help break up the boundary layer as water flows over. So I'm going to keep moving here and look at some other species of seaweed. This is a beautiful species here. Uh, the common name of this one, I'm hoping you can all see in my screen, and I'm hoping you can see the beautiful iridescence that I see through the camera. This is either the species Maziella or uh, Iridae, um, the genus Iridae. Um, I don't have a slide for this just because there are so many different species of red algae. I would have hundreds of slides or maybe a hundred slides. So I just typically keep keep them grouped as reds but this particular one uh, I can point out again the iridescent uh, red algae. One interesting fact about this specimen is that the iridescence is caused by the refraction of light on, on, on the surface of the specimen. Um, so it only, it's only irid, it only iridesces, or it's only shiny when it's wet. And I've tried to press this as a specimen and it doesn't retain that beautiful iridescence. So it's best observed just in, in the water. Let's see, that said, I think maybe we can go back to, um, go back to the slides real quick while I move and walk, because I know the video is not the best when I'm walking. So if we can go to the slide of the different, uh, different um, 
let's look at the slide of the morphology uh, differences between seagrass and uh, seaweed and kelp. And from there, we can talk about the different groups of sea, sea, seaweeds. Someone did post in the Q&A that they would like to see the grass. Oh, OK. Yeah. So Bob, can you put up the slide of the eelgrass real quick? Thanks for asking about eelgrass, by the way. I, I, it's, it's, another, it's another species that are uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, just because of how much time I've spent working on eelgrass uh, in my previous life as a scientific diver, I spent years transplanting this stuff. I basically was a underwater gardener. But not only that, just because of how important this species is, I, I really love talking about it. So thank you for bringing the question up. Eelgrass, uh, the eelgrass that we have here in the Puget Sound, native eelgrass is of the genus species uh, Zostera marina. Uh, they produce these beautiful beds. And uh, generally in their morphology, maybe we can go to that slide with their morphology. There we go. Uh, this is a very nice uh, diagram comparing uh, seagrasses versus uh, macroalgae. Uh, one thing I'll point out at this point is that seagrasses are true plants. They are all vascularized plants. They have roots, they have uh, vessels, uh, phloem and xylem that transports gas and nutrients up and down uh, the body of this plant. Whereas if you look at all macroalgae, which includes seaweed and kelp, those are not true plants. They, they do not have vascularization. Uh, evolutionarily, uh, macroalgae, kelp and seaweeds, uh, are ancestors to, to true vascularized plants like, uh, like seagrasses. And, and how I like to look at seagrasses evolutionarily, because they're true plants, they, they are plants that uh, evolved from plants that came out of the water, but they decided to go back in the water. So if you think about our marine mammals, you know, uh, organisms, that, uh, animals that came onto land, started breathing air, but then decided to go back into the water, but they still retain that uh, physiology of breathing air. That's what seagrasses are. They're, they're, they're land plants that came, originally came out of the water, but they evolutionarily found a niche and decided to go back into the water and they retain that vascularization. Uh, and being a true plant, uh, eelgrass actually flowers and produces seeds, though most of its growth is just through propagation through those rhizomes or the runner roots that you see in this figure. Um, uh, one other thing I will mention, and sorry, I'm getting the sniffles a little bit. My mask is pressing on the bridge of my nose. <laughs> um, but one other thing to point out about the eelgrass is that uh, like most submerged aquatic vegetation, they are highly plastic. So what that means ecologically, again, is that they, they exhibit various uh, and very different growth habits depending on the condition they live in. I've been in, I've done diving and surveys in bays where the water is really calm and we have eelgrass uh, blades that are eight feet long and, and, you know, several inches wide eelgrass blades. And then I've dive, I've done diving in areas where the eelgrass is in high energy areas where they're really short and fine because they, you know, if they were bigger, they'd get torn up. So they're highly plastic and they adapt to their environment. They acclimate. Um, I'm still in the eelgrass bed, and I want to point out some stuff about eelgrass while I'm here. Uh, again, really beautiful specimen. They come out in, the, in, in these sheets, and you'll see that the rhizome are just barely under the surface. I don't want to disturb it too much. There is some dead rhizome and roots. But one good way to identify uh, the native eelgrass versus the invasive Japanese eelgrass or Zostera japonica is that I like to pull the blades apart and the native eelgrass here I hope you can see has all these filaments or strands when you pull it apart gently whereas the invasive eelgrass Zostria japonica does not have these filaments or strands can you guys see that a little blurry okay I could I could kind of see it though yeah, yeah. Well, for that demonstration, you have to be here with me in person. Bob, you have a you have a slide of the the J Japanese eelgrass, but for the sake of not not switching and saving time, let's just keep it live with me here because I see some other kelp specimens. Uh, this is another pretty common kelp. I don't know if I have a slide of this, but we won't go there. This is the five rib kelp or Costeria costarada. Again, it, like all laminarians or kelp. It exhibits all these sculpting patterns that change due to the, uh, depending on the environment it's in. 
really nice specimen here. This one is detached. You can see it's not attached to anything and washed up. Okay, so yeah, while I walk, can we can we uh, go to go back to the slideshow and I'm gonna talk generally now about uh, macroalgae in the different groups. Ma'am, I think your mic moves around a little bit. Yeah, I I I just moved it just because of okay. my sniffles. Okay, okay. Hopefully you it can sounds better. Hey, let's stay on the slide while we're here. Uh, I noticed as seagrass morphology, uh, but I can also use the figure to talk about uh, macroalgae. I, in fact, think the next slide has the has the bullet for macroalgae. But uh, oh, there we go. Thank you. The difference with macroalgae, you know, being not a true plant versus seagrasses, which are true plants with vascularization and roots, is that macroalgae has hold fast or or that structure that looks like roots that it uses to hold on to the hard substrate or bottom. The thing is that uh, physiologically, the hold fast is just there to hold the specimen in place. It doesn't absorb nutrients. Uh, it's not a site specifically for absorbing nutrients like it is in uh, true plants in the roots. Um, as a matter of fact, algae uh, are able to uh, uptake nutrients and, and do gas exchange along its entire uh, the surface of its entire body. So that hold fast is really just there to hold, hold it in place. Uh, instead of having a stem on algae, we call it a stipe. And uh, instead of leaves, we call these blades. And again, some very specialized kelps have what we call pneumatocysts or little air bladders to help, help it float. All right, so if we go to the next slide, we can talk about generally the different groups of seaweed. So although, sorry, I had to move my mic again. So although I went into quite a bit of uh, depth about the different uh, species of kelp, because they're, they're, there's a handful of them and they're very charismatic, they're really easy to see, I didn't, um, I didn't really, I'm not going to go into too much depth identifying the red or green algaes just because there are so many of them. But in general, when you're looking at macroalgae, they're broken up into three different groups. We basically have the greens, which you see on this slide. We have the chlorophytes. Next slide. We have the rhodophytes, the red algae. And then we have the, the brown kelps, uh, the brown algae, the phaophytes. There we go. Uh, now, although kelp fall under the brown group, the phaophytes, not all brown algae are kelps, but all kelp are brown algae, if that makes sense. A kelp is a subgroup of the phaophytes, the, the browns. So at this time, I think this is a good point to do another poll question. On it. Okay, so this says, why are seaweed different in color? And so they're starting to roll in. different responses. Great, I'll give this about five more seconds. All right, thanks everybody for participating in this. All right, almost got everyone. Okay, so I'm going to the... share the results. Can you see them? Yes, I can. All right, so you had 76% say all the above, 14% said it's from different photoactive pigments. 5% say it's affects, um, the different colors affect their ability to absorb light at different depths. And 5% say it's due to their evolutionary history. Oh, very good. Well, I got good news for everybody. Everybody's right. There's no <laughs> wrong answer for this poll question. Um, yeah, you are all correct. Uh, evolutionarily, there are various ways to look at this, but uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, the colors uh, correspond to their, their evolutionary history and are a result of, of their past. Uh, the colors that we actually see physiologically or, or anatomically in the algae are caused by the different uh, photoactive pigments that they have. You know, uh, obviously the green is produced by coral, chlorophyll. Some of the reds and and uh, the reds and Browns are caused by a combination of carotenoids and phycobilins and a bunch of other photoactive pigments. Uh, one thing I will mention to everybody as far as color of algae goes, uh, in general, the, 
if what you see is what you get, if you see something green, it's probably a green algae. But there are some caveats. There are some specimens that are actually red, but they look uh, they look green, or vice versa. There are some specimens that are are green, but are actually a different type. So really helpful to have a guide to identify these. Um, one good example of that, what I just said, is uh, the seaweed nori. Uh, it's Pophyra, or now it has been renamed Priopria, but it's a seaweed that we all eat if you eat uh, sushi, the nori wrapping. That is actually a red algae. Um, but is when you get it in the stores, when you get it on your sushi, it looks green. That's only because when in the drying or uh, processing of that seaweed, the red uh, pigments actually fade faster. So once all the red pigments fade, it, it leaves a seaweed that looks green because the chlorophyll stays. Um, so that's a really fascinating example of that. Great. The last thing I will touch on in terms of the color of the different seaweed is, yes, uh, the last the last part of that uh, poll question is true too. It corresponds to the different depth that these algae live at. And there is a really interesting thing here that you can observe readily in the Puget Sound or in the Sailor Sea because of the extreme tidal range that we have. Uh, there's something known as uh, a vertical zonation or intertidal zonation where you have these bands of life where they group together based on the different uh, depth or, or, or depth zones that they live at. And that vertical zonation is exhibited by everything from barnacles to oysters to mussels. You know, they all live at very distinct uh, elevations or bands on the beach. But as you can see right here in front of me, algae are living at very distinct elevations too. Um, that's because they have evolved these pigments to, to photosynthesize best at different depths of water. So obviously the, uh, the greens, I, I don't know if that's as obvious, but because red fades out of the uh, red, the color red or light in the spectrum of red uh, is filtered out by seawater the quickest. Um, <laughs> let's see, now I need to think about my, my ocean optics here for a second. But basically, they, not to get really deep into the optical physics of this and the refraction or filtration of light from seawater, uh, you know, the deeper you go, you go from from green algae to some of the reds and then some of the browns. But the exception, again, there's there are always exceptions in, in the natural world. The brown algae sometimes have air bladders that allow them to get up and above everything else. Um, but I hope that everybody sees that zonation in front of me uh, and they, they, they know what I'm talking about when they're on a beach and have been out there and have seen how these different colors correspond to depths. If you want to dive deep more deeply into just how light uh, you know, is filtered out by seawater, that's a conversation we can have later. We can look up some more resources. So very good. You have fucus or rockweed out here. And by the way, uh, I have since walked to the end of the spit just to show everybody. While we were on our slideshow, I quickly walked over here. So now looking back at the buildings at Point Hudson, the lagoon is in there and I'm standing on the spit. And I'm on the eastern edge of the spit, right at the line where all the kelp is. So I'm gonna go out here and see if there are some other spe uh, specimens to point out anything of interest. You see there is a lot of that mid-rib uh, winged kelp, Elyria marginata there. You see a lot of the shiny iridescent maziella. But one really interesting specimen that I like to point out, that's not it, it's over here. Is this really light color stuff? This is the scientific name for this one is Desmarestia lingulata. This is the common name is acid weed. So it's called acid weed for a very good reason because it produces acid. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that acid is what's bleaching this out in the sun right now. Um, it's a specimen that I always like to point out. Uh, because it has that unique feature of producing acid. And a lot of times when I'm out on the beaches or when I'm snorkeling, I see that this specimen uh, tends to last the longest throughout the season. It tends to have the least epiphytes or fouling by uh, other algae that grows on top of it. So I um, I'm, I'm haven't really looked into this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the acidity of it is what helps it uh, last longer in the season and prevent things from growing on it. I also like to point out this specimen because uh, 
I collect algae to press. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is if you mix an acid weed with the rest of your specimens, it will bleach everything out like this. So something worth pointing out there. Let's see. How am I doing on time? Should I keep going or should, should, should we turn to questions? You're doing great. You have uh, about 12 minutes left. I do have four, four to five questions. So we okay. can. And I had a quick question, ma'am, in that slide that I shared with everybody. Um, what, you, what you showed live on the beach was kind of like a, like, like a super plastic. Mm -hmm. But the picture w did not look like that at all. Oh, do you want to share the picture? Yeah, why don't why don't you share the picture of the of the acid weed? Because I do have a slide of that. Yeah, it's absolutely one of my fa favorite specimens to press. Look how beautiful that is once it's pressed and splayed out. So this again is acid weed, Desmarestia lingulata. Uh, like I mentioned, I always like to look at these specimens and their, their different growth habits. What's really cool about this one is that the blades come off of the edge of the bigger blades. So if you look at that specimen on the that's pressed out real nicely on the left image there, you see that you have one big blade from which there are medium-sized blades coming off of it, from which there are smaller blades coming off the edge of that blade. So really interesting growth habit really interesting growth pattern. There's another red algae that looks like this that I really love, but instead of the blades coming off the edge, they come off the midrib. And they come off of the midrib of the smaller blades and so forth and so forth. So there's this really beautiful symmetry uh, about the growth habit of a lot of these algae. Thank you for showing this one, Bob. Sorry, I was just gonna say while we're on there, why don't we go to the sea spaghetti? Uh, do you have I do have a quick question from somebody on acid weed. They want to know if it's good or bad for the ocean. Uh, well, it's it's uh it's it's a native species. It's natural, um, and and I I would guess that the question stems from the fact that it's acidic, and I would say there's nothing inherently wrong about it, it naturally being acidic. Um, so I I would I would say it's good to have have this stuff around. Um, yeah, I don't think that acidity causes any harm immediate in the immediate area. It just uh, it's a protective mechanism that it has, you know, just like how some land plants taste bad. Uh, yeah. Great. Someone else also followed up. What is the evolutionary importance of acid weed? Um, I, I I'm gonna interpret that question as you know what's the what's the uh, significance of the acidity and again i think it's a defense mechanism uh, uh time and time again i've no noticed the desmarestia or acid reed uh just having better shape throughout the year a lot of algae by uh a lot of kelp and algae by midsummer they 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 start getting overgrown with epiphytes or they're fouled by uh, other algae grown on them and they start to deteriorate uh, I don't notice that as much with the acid weed, and I think a lot of it has to do with the acidity uh, warding off um, uh, fouling by epiphytes. So I see that now we're to the slide of the one red algae that I did uh, specifically uh, put a genus and species on is uh, sea spaghetti, just because this is a really common one, ubiquitous. I see it everywhere, and I see it in front of me here. Um, on the ground, but on this slide too, this is a really easy one to identify. And the name is Sarcodeotheca gaudi chaudii. It used to have another, now now I'm blanking on the, oh, it used to be in, it used to be named Grassalaria. But, you know, honestly, it, it, for our audience members, if you know the common name, that's good enough. Us scientists will always be splitting and lumping and the names are always changing. <laughs> but uh, ecologically, it, it's a red algae and, and it, it's really interesting. And we have some on the beach here in front of me. Um, Great. Oh, we're back to we're back to me. Right there it is. Some of the Sarcodeotheca gaudi chaudii. Um, while I'm here, I'll show some of the other fine red algae. This is one that is uh, this is uh, from the genus Aldonthalia, and I do apologize naming it by the scientific names after telling you guys not to worry about it. But that's how I know them from. That's how I know them by. This uh, I think the common name of this one is the sea brush. It's really hard to identify these really fine reds. And this is one that looks brown, but it's in the, it's in the order of red algaes. It just have different, uh, different pigmentation. It's really hard to identify these without looking at the growing tip. You would really have to zoom in and look at the grown tip and get a good specimen that's not degraded. Um, that's why I didn't 
have too much of the ID for red algae out. But if you ask me, uh, the, some of the reds are the really fine lacy reds are some of the most beautiful specimens that you can find. And uh, with that, I'm going to move over to some surf grass real quick because I do want to talk about surf grass. This is one unique, unique uh, location that has both eelgrass and surf grass. That's what you're seeing here. So this is Phyllospadex, uh, is the genus. This is different from eelgrass evolutionarily. Uh, they grow on hard substrate. They grow on hard things. Eelgrass like to grow in sand. Uh, now, and although this looks sandy, if you dig in here, there is some hard pan. And so that's why it, uh, both species of seagrass are able to live here. Because we have a beach that has both hard pan and sand. I probably won't be able to show this. Uh, but because surf grass likes to live on hard surfaces, their roots uh, produce these structures called sand socks. They basically produce really fuzzy roots that trap a lot of sand. And when you look at it whole, it looks like a, a sock full of sand or almost looks like uh, the leg of a bumblebee that's full of pollen, right? So these so sand socks swell up into the, any crevice on rocks and whatnot, and that's how they hold on to them. So I just wanted to show that because it's really interesting. See, you have rock here, and that's what, and this is all rock. And there's some sand in between, and that's basically what what's, uh, this surf grass is ho holding on to. Don't want to disturb it too much. Anyways. Hey. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, I'm gonna um, shoot some questions your way, if that's okay. We have about five minutes left. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so one person asked, if there is much more sea lettuce growing on rocks than you've ever seen before, is that the result of some imbalance? Oh my goodness, thank you for asking that question. Uh, wow, I want to know who asked that question. That's the best question of the day. Um, yes, I, I am noticing a lot of this green sea lettuce, or the genus of which is Ova, grown out here and i have steadily noticed this uh you know in the time that i've spent in the salish sea that steadily there has been more and more ova on these beaches um the green sea lettuce and if you ask me professionally based on my judgment as a as a scientist i would say yes it's, it's indicative of some kind of imbalance um that's because ova, this green sea lettuce, is known as a weedy species. So just like all plants, you have plants that are, are able to grow and thrive in, in non-ideal conditions or in conditions that are uh, over new, where there's too much nutrients. And so ova is one of those species that when there's too much nutrients in the water, they're able to really thrive and grow fast. And in turn, they outcompete all the other species of seaweed and macroalgae that can't grow as fast. And so for me, when I see a lot of this green stuff on the beach, it is indicative that there's too much nutrients here, that the ova is taking advantage of that state of high nutrients or what we scientists call eutrophication, and it's smothering and outcompeting all of the other um, macro algae on this beach. Now, how does that affect, you know, is one algae the same as another algae? Well, well of course not. Um, but how does that, you know, affect the, the ecology on this beach? Well, what I'll say is that functionally, you know, although ova can grow really fast, it doesn't produce, it doesn't provide as much nutrients as some of the other kelp or seaweed. Uh, as a matter of fact, ova produces a compound uh, that has been st well studied um, called DMSP dimethosulfopropanate. It's an anti herbivory compound. It, it, it's produced for the sole purpose of preventing, uh, deterring herbivores from grazing snails uh, and isopods from grazing on it. So there's not, there are not too many species of organisms that actually eat ova because of that uh, noxious herbivory, anti herbivory compound. So, you know, it, it grows a lot when there's a lot of nutrients, not too many things eat it. But at the same time, it outcompetes and it smothers out some other uh, seaweed that might be more beneficial, right? Other species that are more complex. This stuff is not only do not, uh, are there not too many things that eat it, but it's not very complex. You know, you can see when it gets dry, it smothers the beach. And even underwater, when, when it's inundated, it's just a thin sheet. So you can imagine if you were a critter, you're 
fish, you're a juvenile crab, it doesn't provide as much uh, complexity or nooks and crannies to hide in as opposed to some of that other algae out there that has branching patterns or might have uh, a pneumaticist to make it uh, float. It's just not as good. And yeah, that that's you can tell you hit a nerve with that question. <laughs> I was going to say, um, we have about two minutes left. I have, I have five more questions for you. <laughs> okay, please please go ahead. Okay, so one person asked if there's any projects in the Puget Sound area that you know of in which citizen scientists can participate in marine habitat restoration. Uh, absolutely. There are plenty. I don't know off the top of my head, but if you if you contact me, I think my, con my contact information is provided. I can, I can try to help, help hook you up, but there are plenty of opportunities to volunteers to, to engage. Okay. And then um, do you do anything with Puget Sound Restoration without the Bull Cup Restoration? Yes, I do. Um, well, being a habitat biologist, I actually am uh, the state's land use regulator when it comes to activities in the water. So I actually reviewed and uh, permitted one of the one of the restoration projects. Um, and so I'm very familiar with what they're doing, and I think I think it's very interesting. Okay, cool. And then, do you know um, which kelp species Americans used in their diets? All of them. <laughs> okay, great. And then way early on, someone asked, is there any natural tidal marsh present today from areas where there was marsh in the mid 1800s? Ooh, that's a very good question. You know, uh, shoreline real estate is, is, is a big thing in this state and there really are not too many areas that uh, uh, are still pristine. Um, I think even Rab's Lagoon that Jeff went to, there was a tidal gate or some kind of uh, structure at the entrance of it. Um, I would say look at some more natural areas. If you can look at the like na uh, national parks, you know, I imagine there would be a nice tidal marsh at, at the inside of the Dungeness Spit. You know, that's a big park. Um, I'm looking over there across that Indian Island. You know, that's a huge military complex that's off off limits to development and and whatnot. But as a result of that, that becomes kind of a nature sanctuary. And I do know there are some salt marshes in there. So yeah, there are a lot of salt marshes around still. Great. And then um, going back to that slide that we have of the eelgrass, um, yep. do eelgrass really have a flower like that? Yes, they do. Um, I've seen like mix, I've seen mix uh, pictures, but I, 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 I swear I have seen a picture of eelgrass with a nice little white uh, fluorescence flower. But I've also seen other pictures online where the flower is, is just nothing more but two, uh, two little, um, what do they call in the flower structures? Not stigmas, but maybe, pest yeah, and yeah, two little stigmas that st st uh, stick out. But if you Google it, you can find it yourself. <laughs> okay, and then the last question I have is, what type of blotter paper do you use for pressing? And with that, I'm going to go ahead and post your the link to your video. <laughs> Yeah, please do. And, and you know, <laughs> now that I know the video is being shared uh, far and wide, I will caveat and say this is, this is a video I kind of did on the side and not very professionally for some friends, but I'm happy people are using it. I, I use ink, uh, I use watercolor paper, actually. Uh, what, I, what I like to mention is I use something that is really thick and absorbent. That way the slimy kelp, and, and I make sure the paper is wetted before I press onto it, because once it's drying, the slimy kelp will basically glue itself to that really absorbent paper. Cool. And I just shared the link in the chat. I have one last question, and then um, we should wrap it up and let people go. Sure. Um, so someone was on a foraging trip recently, and the lead diver mentioned that all sea plants are edible, as long as the texture is palatable. Is that accurate? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, I'd say generally so, you know, I like to always joke that I'm a very adventurous eater, so I like to say everything's edible once. Uh -huh. uh, but generally, um, all, all kelp, I, I don't, let me answer another, let me, let me rephrase my answer. There are no seaweed or submerged aquatic vegetation I know of that is poisonous, that would kill you. Uh, there are there are some that are not very palatable. There are some that are very kind of not that doesn't taste well. Like I said, some of these species have anti herbivory compounds. They're there to deter herbation, uh, you know, herbivory or predation. Um, 
So some of this stuff would not taste the best, but uh, in, for the most part, I don't think there's anything that would kill you. Um, don't hold me to that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is a good point. Uh, point. This is a good time for me to remind everybody: if you are interested in, in harvesting, even for pressing, if you're not eating it, and even if you're just picking up some of the rack from washed up on the beach for your garden as fertilizer and whatnot, make sure you have the appropriate licenses so you don't get in trouble with Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and also make sure that you are following all harvest rules. In Washington State, uh, the rules are pretty complex. You don't just have to have a permit. Uh, it's a shellfish and seaweed permit from Fish and Wildlife, but you also have to follow the rules for the land that you're on. For example, uh, some Department of Natural Resource lands you can't harvest from, some you can, and same with state parks. So make sure you follow the rules. And last but not least, uh, follow uh, the harvest uh, guidelines because you don't want to rip things up by the roots right you want to harvest it in such a way in such a way that it will regrow so you you know you're not going to go out there and rip out a kelp by the hold fast uh, with that all said you know in my pressing presentation you'll see that there are some spe specimens that have hold fast or have the bulb on there that i'm pressing that's all stuff that has been washed up on the rack line so those those things aren't attached anymore so keep that in mind oh thank you um, I think that wraps us up. We're just a few minutes over. So thank you everybody for sticking around and attending. Thank you Nam for taking us to Point Hudson and sharing all your knowledge on seaweeds. Everyone stay safe. Take care. Enjoy the beach. Bye everybody. Thanks.